obviously that's something a little bit different in our film and television world that we make something and then we have a village to help us market it. Um, you know, clearly you have publishers and you have editors to help you do that. But do you feel like a huge responsibility to do some of that marketing yourself? I have a, a huge amount of respect for the people I know who self-publish. Right. Because when you self-publish, you have to do it all yourself. One of the things that I love about Harlequin is because they're known, mm -hmm. and, and all of my books are purple or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that people will go into Walmart or Chapters or the drugstore and, and, they, know, and they know to look for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel, I feel you know, lucky that I, that I write for a brand that's, that's well known mm -hmm. uh, because I do know a lot of self-published authors who are very successful, mm -hmm. but they have to be their own marketing team. They have to, they have mm -hmm. to do all that all that themselves. Mm. Stephanie? Yes. <laughs> it is. You do some self-publishing. I'm right? just getting into it now. So yeah. yeah, I have done 30 plus books in the traditional space and I'm now starting to move into the hybrid model, which is where I'm continuing mm -hmm. to do traditionally published books mm -hmm. and also self-publishing. And it is kind of like starting from scratch in a way because you have to think about every person at the publisher that touched your book. You are now that person and you have to understand what that job is. And it's a lot to learn but at the same time the creative freedom is just amazing and knowing that I can write whatever it is that I want to write and find an audience for that I think is really inspiring and especially being someone who writes books set in Australia that hasn't always been the easiest thing for me to publish in the US. I've had books rejected because of the location and so now that I can put those books out myself and have a bit of control over it. It's really exciting and I need that motivation when I'm trying to figure out how to do a newsletter automation and I want to beat my head against a wall. <laughs> now what about audiobooks? Have you, has any of your novels <laughs> transposed <laughs> to audiobooks? I, I, I'm laughing. I had a book that was part of a larger series for Harlequin and I knew in my head that the series was set in Texas. But when it got turned into an audiobook, oh. and I heard my characters with this really, like, really heavy southern accent, it was just, it was just really weird to listen to my book and to hear some and to hear that really. I mean, I used to live in the southern U United States. I'm used to the accent, but I didn't like hear my characters that way. Mm -hmm. So they had the really the really heavy southern drawl. That that was fun. So if you look at my audiobook, you can you can go I'm for the accent. I'm in on that for sure. Sorry, what's the name of that book? Standing Fast. Standing Fast. Excellent. Well, Stephanie, if there was one particular novel that you had that could be adapted into a film, let's put the budget at thirty million. Uh, why not? I've never been there before, but sure, let's go there <laughs> now and say well, who would you cast in in one of your novels that are being adapted. Uh, well, I have a book coming out next year, which has, I'm sorry, it has a dog in it. It's a <laughs> $30 million picture. I we can cast dogs. dogs all day long. All it's day called long. The Dash Hound Wears Prada. Oh, beautiful. And it is basically what would happen if the devil wears Prada, if Miranda Priestly was a dog. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it has a, a hero that's a very, like, reclusive billionaire and a heroine that is a social media guru who has just gone viral for all the wrong reasons. And she ends up being his dog sitter and having to take the dog to the pet psychic appointments and the fancy dog salon. I would put Chris Hemsworth in because I'm Australian and I feel like I'd be a traitor to my country if I you didn't would say be that. a traitor to your country. Yes. yes. And, and I all womankind. And it's a, it's really it's a gift for everyone. Yes, mm -hmm. it is a gift for everyone. Correct. <laughs> and for the heroine, I think is it was it Lily Collins that was in um, Emily in Paris. Yes, that was. She well. has that like yes. carefree, like young vibe. I find her really engaging to watch, and I think that they would be a lot of fun together. Paula and I have actually just collaborated on a movie that was based on John Denver's mm -hmm. uh, Take Me Home Country Roads, mm -hmm. and it's Country Roads Christmas. And that also was, you know, we're working with uh, a network out of the U.S., and it's, it's launching in 2022. Do you want to talk a little bit about that script? Because it was a really interesting yeah. journey to adapt that. That was fun. That was really fun working with you on that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, because Beth wanted it to be multi-generational, which I love because it's like, you know, the, I mean, you have to have the, well, you don't have to have the young people, I guess, but in romance, it's usually, you know, everybody's 29, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, we do have some conventions, so there's that, but then, but then also the father, who's the old country singer, and I love writing lyrics. I write a lot of music and lyrics too. So for me, that's so fun to 
add in all that extra stuff and as particularly country music is mm -hmm. I find really dovetails with romance because you're it's the heartbreak it's, it's yeah what you were saying just it all comes from the heart and so to have those two generations coming together and the family and it's Christmas and then that country road song that everybody knows I feel like like we had a responsibility to make it a story that really feels satisfying by the end of it that you want that character to be driving home take me home country roads like you you got to earn that you know so i felt like we did i'm, I'm excited to see it we did a great job i think on it and i think what's what's you know again the multi-generational stuff on it but i feel that yeah, that to keep we have a challenge too when we're doing that is again you have that now you have a mul like different levels of characters to mm -hmm. service. So, if there was one of the books that you've written that you felt would adapt to the screen the best, what 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 story would you, would you like to see producers hear about or think about? My, my biggest challenge is I really like the big set pieces where things blow up and things catch fire. So I, I, my, that's the problem. I, I make yeah. this little, like, everyone's in the small town and then suddenly I put the helicopter chase. So, so well, you know. I, I want to say nicely, no, that's but not no. a challenge for us, though. No, you can do no, the helicopter chase. No, you can chase. do that stuff now. And we've actually been working uh, with a network in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they, they have been letting us push our boundaries as well and do much more action. And uh, these were original concepts. They were not uh, adaptations. Um, but, we, you know, we sent people down rapids and jumped off yeah. cliffs. Wow. And nice. I mean, we do, we're very fortunate at BrainPower that we have our own visual effects team here in-house. So uh, one of the things that we always say to to, to writers too when we're, we're working on that like easy things is actually fire smoke okay. explosion really? like those are all those are all softwares that exist now mm. or the day you told me that yeah. dog sledding was fine i, I, was I like, didn't know really, like, really? Cool. put them all Let's in you need software for cats i have a book coming out uh, next year i just finished it 2022. yeah 2022 it's my 25th harlequin which is which is an no, exciting milestone that's exciting. thank you and Very it's nice. it's called Wilderness Survival, right. and the, the these are the two people who used to work together, hate each other. Um, there's a camp, and his daughter gets kidnapped and taken down the rapids in a boat. Whoa. So she goes with so she gets kidnapped as well. So the heroine and the kid down the rapids in the boat, and then he has to get in a canoe and go after it, and it's all canoeing. When I was young, we went on a canoe trip and stumbled across a ghost town, and I've always wanted to do that. Oh, we, we found a ghost so town good. in Ontario, so I'm like, okay, so there's gonna be a ghost. Spoilers, they find a ghost town, and, and I, I just love that Canadian setting, the big granite rocks and the rivers oh, and the for trees. Sure. And it was really, it was a fun challenge too to have a kid who gets kidnapped at the beginning along with the heroine right. because how do you keep it from being too scary right. that people, you know, so that it was, it was fun and then they got to bond. And yes, well, and that is a little slight challenge, you know, again, dogs, but, and children too. But if, if something happens to them and it's why, you know, it's very challenging sometimes for us to do stories um, like we did uh, a, a series of Very Country Christmas mm -hmm. I, is based on a Karen Rose a novel mm -hmm. and it's a single mother. So mm -hmm. like you're always like, especially if you, you know, for parents who are watching it, they're always like, where's the kid? Where's the kid? You right. know? And then you have yeah. to, uh, then you have to event, <laughs> invent a whole set of like parents or guardians mm -hmm. and where can that kid go? Same thing with, with dogs. But I think the ones where, you know, the kids in, in, yeah the unit um that that does work so and how would you cast that like uh, do you ever th if you could I, have any I, I always in the oh world. i've got to think about that now um because I, I, I always do it i always cast the movie i always look at the characters and and try to figure out who they would be in in real life but i always do go online and, and pinterest and i pull up my different heroes my, see here's the funny thing 
I can't remember the actors' names because to me they're the character, right? right? Yeah. So I'm watching television and I'm like, oh, that's my character from this book, that's my character from that book. Because to me, when I see them, I see the character, so then I completely draw so a blank. So you do kind of like, that's what we do. So when we're casting a movie, we'll do what's called a casting lookbook. And, yeah. and generally, like I, you know, I don't know, we're doing a family movie right now, mm -hmm. we're looking for Santa. San Richard Gere's on the list for Santa. Like, it's never gonna happen. But anyways, it's just kind of that sort of, if you could cast anyone in the world. So, but you're right. So you kind of put together your own put casting together the lookbook. lookbook. Yeah, and, and all the, but the problem is then I completely draw a blank. I say on like the actor's real names. Right. Because, because I'm too busy it. thinking, you know. And that's even when I'm watching television and I see a minor character and I'm like, ah, IMDB, who is that person? Pull up their picture, put them in, put them, I put them in my cast and build my lookbook. So you are using a real visual tool yes. for you to write yes. with. A very visual. And, and I was saying earlier, like, I have to see the movie in my mind. I have to watch it before I write it, just watch it in my mind. And sometimes I feel like, you know when you're on an airplane and you're watching somebody else's movie? It's like that. I can see it, but I can't figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I have to like, you know, try to guess what's, ha what's happening. Do you, do you see your own movies when you're no, writing them? I, not really, <laughs> even though I do think of myself as a visual person, but I, I, I really start with the you the, write. The, yeah, I just I just write and write and write and write. Yeah, because I've seen I've seen some of of Paula's internal workings, and yeah, sorry you know, about that. No, no, I I really <laughs> appreciate it because it's it's just you know for for us on the producing side of things and like how is it going to now move you know through the evolution and the pieces that it needs to do to become a, a movie mm -hmm. i think it's super important and it's always been helpful to see um a lot of writers write in a program called final draft that's mm -hmm. the that's a software that a lot of screenwriters use and i think it allows also to put the act points in mm -hmm. and really figure out where the conflict's going to hit and you know, because there is a bit of an ebb and flow. Um, there's, you know, there's there's guides that you can use. Um, some people use a, a thing called Save the Cat, oh, yes. which is, yeah. yes, which is. Do you guys uh, ever use that or not? Yeah, it's yeah. they use it a lot actually in writing craft workshops. It's like one of the key books that is often right. recommended is Save the Cat. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's very. I've been pretty into it lately. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just so easy, shorthand. I mean, with screenplays, it's just mm -hmm. it's all about structure. Yes. Like if you don't state the theme by page five. He's right. It'll, yeah. It's like people are looking for it. Like, what yeah. is this movie about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it just, and then everything can really, if it's not tight knitting, and Stephanie, you were saying that you're starting to knit, but really I always think about when we're, when we're doing scripting and we're getting ready to, to film, like it is really knitting. And if you look back and you've missed a loop mm -hmm. back to like seven rows, mm -hmm. if you don't go and find it, you'll be sitting in the edit suite with like, Oh, I guess we're doing a pickup day today, which is right, exactly. not the thing that the 40, 1940s producer wants me to ever hear. <laughs> pickup days, I don't think and so. And you can tell which yeah. scenes are going to end up on the cutting room floor because if they don't hit any of yeah. those points, they don't I mean, you guys story. know what, you're, what the fat you can trim from your books. Sure. It's, it's even more... I don't want to say more important, but it's more um, the consequences are you've, you've paid for this scene that is really just wasting everyone's time. But I think, I mean, your editors help you with yeah. that as well. I mean, you have to write to a specific format, especially on the print publishing side of things. Yeah, I, I did, I, I have a beef to settle with an, someone I will not name on the internet who went and said the difference between filmmaking and books is filmmaking, everything has to fit and have a purpose. And in books, you can just go off on wild tangents for no purpose. And I'm like, no, it, it all, and if that's what I love about the job is the scene, everything fit. Mm -hmm. On those final drafts, you're like, ah, so that he drinks from a mug in page two so that the mug can break on page 100. And then she hands him a mug, the final scene. Like that, that to me is magic, right? Absolutely. Fitting it and all I in think together. That whoever is beefing it up, mm -hmm. um, really doesn't understand some rudimentary things about storytelling, mm -hmm. especially in this world that we live in now. I mean, mm -hmm. I grew up in a world where there was limited channels. There was, you know, there was to, to actually watch something, you had to physically buy something, DVD mm -hmm. or something. And that's, you know, when we have the generations coming up behind us who are just can flip to anything out of whim. Like if you don't, 
it's not just hooking them in, it's just the journey that whether it's to read a book or to sit down passively and, and watch a full movie, it has to, there has to be purpose mm -hmm. the real, and heart, as you said. Because if, if those two things aren't there, why would you continue to read past the 20th page and why would you continue to watch past the you know, ninth minute? Mm -hmm. um, well, so. and to your point about people saying how easy romance is, it's like, okay, I'd like to see you plot out a love yeah. story. I mean, it's hard, those emotional arcs, you know, you have to get inside that person's head and if the reader isn't feeling it or the viewer, it's like, you know when a scene is falling flat and it's, you gotta dig deeper and pull something out, even though it's just romance, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be a satisfying story if you don't see how that, how she came to love him by the end of it and all those little, subtle turning points along the way, you know, it's, you look at a specific scene, well, what is this about? Okay, they had to get from A to B, but during that scene, she has to see something yeah. in him mm -hmm. that pulls from her history, yep. you know, and then you see it and they, the reader sees it, mm -hmm. and that's like, that's, that's where the magic happens, I think. Like what you said earlier about it being earned. Like they have to right. earn that moment, you see it. Mm. It's true, and for some of these longer books too, we're trying to sustain these two characters. Sorry, can you just define longer books just for oh, people yeah. who don't know, because, go ahead. So these are generally the one -on -one. about sort of 90 to 100,000 words. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a suspense novel that's longer, you could pros push it to maybe 110, but so we're talking maybe 350 pages. Right. And in a contemporary romance especially, it's just the two people and their world, and you have to tell a compelling love story that's gonna last that amount of time, that has all the moments of tension that are gonna pull the reader through. You can't let anything fall flat because there's millions of books out now. Mm -hmm. They will just put it down and pick up something else. So you have to figure out how do you sustain that over the course of the time and keep growing these characters, making them more interesting, bringing out their backstory. Every scene has got to work as hard as the one before it. And do you have a lifeline? Is there someone that you call if to, to get you know any help or anything if you get stuck or are you just I do, I have singular? A I have a friend of mine who's also a writer and she, like, I, I wish I could live in her brain for a day. She is so creative and can just, like, spot a problem instantly. So sometimes I'm like, something's wrong with this book. I don't know what's wrong with it. This is blah, word vomit. Everything that I have in this story. And she's like, it's this thing. It's <laughs> incredible. So, but I think we can't, like, we get so close to our own work that it's really hard. I can do it for other people, but I can't do it for myself all the time. And Maggie, what about you? Do you, find, do you have a, a support system? I, I, I find that for me personally, and people are different, the, the people who are my personal, emotional, everyday support system and the people who are my writing system are, are, two, different, are two different sets of people. Uh, working on series with other Harlequin writers has been wonderful because I know them and I can just throw out something on email and get a response. And we do that, we get stuck. You know, and, 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 the, and writers talk online. Also um, on Twitter, I have befriended a lot of authors. Mm -hmm. And if I'm like, okay, I'm stuck on a plot point and you throw it out and just having people to bounce back with, even if they bounce back with the wrong ideas, it, at least it opens the dialogue mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, you, and you start that. Wrong ideas are yeah. fine. Yeah. I think one of the mistakes that some people make, it depends on who your family is, depends on who your parents, your partner, whatever, but no, but a lot of people can't go to their romantic partner or their mom or their grandma. Uh, someone I love very deeply just told me yesterday, uh, she said, I wanted to read your books, but I can't because I just, I, it's just too much you and I get too emotionally. And, and so the advice I have for people who want to become writers is you look for your people who are going to be able to help you. If you give this book to your grade 12 teacher or your mom or your best friend, and they don't get into it, that doesn't mean you're a bad writer. Mm. Right. That means you haven't found your people to connect with to help you. Right, well, and I think it kind of, in our, I use always the word term craft. Mm. You know, like writing is a craft, mm -hmm. you know, directing is a craft. You, people who hone their crafts, you can have mentors mm -hmm. that you go to, you know, to look towards, to, to see if you need help. And it, it's, yes, it, it is somebody generally on the industry side of mm -hmm. things that can really be a, a help to you. Is there, was there any mentors that you had kind of 
Growing uh, up in the writing side of things? Yeah, my whole family really. My, <laughs> my mom writes. Oh, that's she's right. written a novel, yeah. she, she's had poetry published. My dad is an academic writer. My sister's an academic writer on her third book. And right. so, so kind of industry adjacent, yeah, so that's all good. Yeah, the yeah. academic stuff is interesting. It's interesting to watch my sister right now. She's doing a crossover book, and she got me to read it. And it was weird to be on the other side. It was like, oh, how can you make this more commercial? <laughs> Let me tell you for a change, you know? It's not just... But I do rely on my, my partner, my husband, uh, when he comes out of his, his office, I'll be like, what would you do if you were at a barbecue, you know, whatever, the, <laughs> and he'll say something, usually a joke, and, and it does jog me, even if it's something stupid that you would never put in a book or a screenplay. It's, for me, it's just the bouncing. I mean, that's why I like directing, too, because it's coordination and cooperation and working with people and... So like with brain power stuff, I can just call you or Nancy. <laughs> and you know, and it'll start with like, I really want to kill off the mother character. Can I do that? You know, and, and then I'm always good to kill characters. You are, you're Again, pretty good. The that producer way. side of me. Yeah. yeah so kind of I always it's when I'm creating one that I'm like, are they gonna go for this? Maybe that's <laughs> too much casting now. But I have an editor uh, who just moved to Prague. We have two intersections in the day that we can talk, and she's my go-to for everything else. So, yeah, I, I bounce and bounce a lot. I find I'll get stuck 100 times a day if I can't just say something out loud. Hmm. One of my people I bounce with is a self-published author in the southern United States who writes sexy, very, very sexy, paranormal vampire books Ooh. called, uh, her name is Ellie Wilson, and. What she writes and what I write are completely different. And, and there's this misconception sometimes that the person that you bounce off of has to create the exact same thing mm, you do. Right. Yeah. And, and they that's don't, so they can create very different things. And that's what I love about, that I've learned about the romance world is that you can collaborate and love and support each other even if my books and your books are completely different types of books. So I have actually my first indie book, which is very exciting, is coming out next month. It is A Merry Aussie Christmas, and it is my way of sharing a little bit of like what Christmas is like in Australia in a hot weather country with the world. And the hero and heroine in that book are fake married as Mr. and Mrs. Claus. They're like the official Santa and Mrs. Claus for the town, and they are uh, high school sweethearts that kind of had a near miss. So it's like a second chance. He's come back to the town after a period of being away. It also has dogs. I'm sorry, I put dogs in all it's my okay. books. <laughs> it's a $39 budget Lots of dogs. On that one too. Dogs for no everyone. Problem. Yes, and it's set in a fictional town called Patterson's Bluff, which is in Victoria, Australia, the right. state where I'm from. Mm -hmm. It's really like wholesome and fun and all good things. That sounds amazing. Maggie, is there anything that you want to finish off or talk about any of your new releases? I, I get so passionate about encouraging everybody else to go out there and write. I can talk about that. It's, it's, it's my own stuff that's hard to talk about. So I will, I will cheat and say that, um, that, Harlo that the Love Inspired Suspense have been doing these canine series where it's all about this group of canines. And uh, the one that came out this year, Christmas Canine Protectors uh, 2021 is set in Alaska. Exciting. And the one that I'm supposed to be writing when I go back home tonight um, is, is set in the Rocky Mountains. Exciting. Um, and in, in different books, I write different numbers in the series. So that's really fun because you have like these plots that go all the way through and then you get to work with other authors. Paula, we have lots of work to do. We do. <laughs> On our Christmas 2022 <laughs> season. Last year, what happened was is that we had, I mean, obviously in the times of COVID 2020 going into 2021, a lot of the buyers didn't really quite know what they were doing on the on the Christmas side of things. Mm -hmm. So they all sort of said to us, no, we, we have enough. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the season, so we packed away the wreaths that, you know, d you know right after we did uh, um, Country Roads Christmas. And so that was early July, very early for us. We packed them all away. And then by mid-August, our, our buyers were like, we need more Christmas. What do you have? And we were like, what? What? So now it's very challenging for people to make decisions. Um, had been challenging in COVID times for people to make decisions. So, but yeah, it's. it's Although you pivoted pretty quickly on that dancing script, I feel like it's awesome <laughs> as a Christmas script. <laughs> 
I know, as we do. We can yeah, do it. And we've done that with book adaptations. Sometimes we've taken what's called the non-seasonal one. Actually, I believe, um, you know, the, the Christmas Wedding Planners was a 1993 novel that was non-seasonal. Mm -hmm. Um, that was just a, Chris, a date, a date book, and then we made it, we Christmified it, um, and conversely, we've also taken Christmas novels and done it as more non-seasonal. But well, the great thing about Christmas is that there's always the ticking clock. Yeah. It's yes. December, and it's going to end. I mean, maybe it'll end on New Year's, but it's like you've got that month in there, and mm. so it's just a built-in screenplay structure, really. Yes, yes, it's very good, very good. Yeah, so we'll be working on. Uh, Christmas 2022 and uh, our selling season there. Thank you guys so much for coming Thanks out here. and uh, sharing about your journeys and mm -hmm. trials and tribulations. And it feels, you know, as we've, Nancy and I, I have always said that there just seems to be such a kindred spirit mm -hmm. between the two worlds. And we're just really mm -hmm. hoping to build some stronger bridges because there's no reason why this kind of dialogue shouldn't be mm -hmm. happening constantly. Mm -hmm. I think it will help authors get their work more in front of different producers, not just us. And then I also conversely think that screenwriters it's good for us to really understand how how the things that we're adapting, where they came from, and mm -hmm. and what the work is behind it, and how similar it really is. Mm -hmm. Romance on the table. <laughs> That's what we are. Excellent. Thank you guys very Thank much. You. Thank you so much. It was really fun. It was fun.